Ah. Good evening, everybody. Um, so, I'm here to defend uh, why we shouldn't support, why we shouldn't always, I should say, why we shouldn't always support minorities. Um, and I thought I'd, I'd do that by sharing a story. Uh, we probably remember that a few years ago there was um, an incident that happened in America uh, involving uh, George Floyd. Um, this incident sent ripples around the world. Uh, people were outraged, uh, and I myself, I'm not sure if you noticed, but I'm, I'm a minority, I'm a, a black man. Uh, oh, you, you noticed. Okay, cool. So, a lot of people were really um, annoyed with, let's say, the church. Where's your voice in this matter? And, you know, and people were, were marching and rallying. And at first, it all made sense to me. Um, black lives matter. Of course they do. I matter, you know? Some people started to say all lives matter. Maybe they missed the point. I guess they're, they're right, all lives matter. Um, but for me, I changed my mind about supporting this particular movement when I looked beneath the surface um, and found out a little bit more about their core values and their ethos and their manifesto, if you like. Um, and a particular term I read uh, stuck out to me, and it said, uh, we are against the heteronormative nuclear family. And I thought, well, well, what does that mean? What does this have to do with black lives? I'm confused. Um, my observation was that statement seemed to me to go against the order of God. God loves families, doesn't he? What's wrong with a heteronormative family? What's wrong with family? Um, and I began having very difficult conversations because people who shared my, I guess, prejudice were not happy that I wasn't supporting this movement. I wasn't supporting this group of minorities. Um, but for me, As a Christian, I, I, I couldn't do that. Um, so, I don't think we should always support minorities. I think uh, as a Christian, I and we should, as Jesus said, judge fairly. And that might mean not supporting a particular minority group if their ethics are contradictory to what we're taught. Um, there is, however, a minority I think we should support. And if I may read a little bit, I'm going to read from Romans and describe them. Uh, Romans 10 and 13. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe and him whom they have not heard. And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent, as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. It's been my observation that people who share the gospel, people who evangelize, are also a minority. Um, so I'd happily support that minority. But to the question, should we always support minorities? I say, no. Thank you. Thank you very much, Darren. That was really helpful. And it'll, I'm sure at it this church that though young people may be a minority, we have a lot to learn from them. And it's always a, a great delight to hear their wisdom. Um, yeah, so, <laughs> why are you laughing? What's going on there? I don't know. Um, what we notice is um, if somebody calls you prejudice, it's usually, it's usually offensive. But actually, prejudice isn't always a bad thing. 
that in this woman's case, she was clearly prejudiced. She had a preconceived notion of Jesus. Um, but her prejudice made her inquisitive. She's like, why are you asking me? Like, y'all don't mess with us. Um, so <laughs> she wants me to look up there. So, so um, but because her prejudice was coupled with respect, she was able to listen. She was able to have what could have been, an, and in fact was a difficult conversation because actually what Jesus did intentionally, right, was go into the area of, sorry people, I'm going to say a really naughty word here, sin. Right? We don't like to speak about sin in the church, I'm not sure why. But he, he challenges her on her sin. And because he challenges on her sin, the Holy Spirit has an opportunity to convict her of her sin, and then she has an opportunity to repent. And what does she do? Instantly, she goes and shares the gospel. She starts evangelizing. Come and see the man that told me, right? Um, which brought me to the question. It really excited me. I'm just gonna, uh, okay. Um, what might it mean for the church to mirror Jesus' response to the woman? We are and we should have conversations about sin, but we should do it lovingly. We should do it without a preconceived notion of how the person is going to respond favorably or not favorably. But we should give people an opportunity to hear about the good news of Jesus Christ who came to save the world, <laughs> right? Um, and allow them to respond. And hopefully they respond. I want to know more about Jesus. I want to tell everyone about Jesus. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. What would it look like for the church to be more like Jesus in this scenario? We'd be courageous enough to have difficult conversations about sin and repentance and the gospel and how amazing Jesus is for getting on the cross and dying for our sin, rising on the third day, proving that he has authority over death. Anyway, I should probably stop there. Glory to God. What a great ending. Thank you very much. It sounds to have been a very varied and interesting set of discussions and that rounded it off beautifully. Thanks, Darren.